Good morning, Sabbath School. We are so glad that you continue to be with us as we are studying the topic of managing for the master till he comes. Uh, today, we are dealing with a subject that many can identify with in, the, in terms of a struggle or a plan, and that is dealing with debt. And so as we invite God's presence to be with us, I trust that God will be able to lay on our hearts a plan that might help us uh, in this area uh, of dealing with debt. Let's pray. Father, come be with us as we now turn our attention to the word. Help us understand, O oh God, that you have provided to us each a stewardship experience. And so, God, as you have provided means for us, may we learn, O oh God, how best to manage these so that you are honored first and we are able to take your resources to hasten your return. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Once again, we welcome you to the study of the word. And if there is, as we go through this journey for life, the word tells us so many things. And today is no exception. As we go through life, what does the Bible say about that? And that's a, always an enduring question. Mm -hmm. that we need to ask ourselves That's a bad what does the bible say about that and some of us would remember something called the bible speaks well let me let us start with um with the study guide you know, on page 38 it says in the scriptures there are at least 26 references to death to death and all are negative that hmm. is when we go into death they're all negative the bible does not say it's a sin to borrow money but it does talk about the often bad consequences of doing so this week we consider the reasons for that for getting into debt and how to deal with it our memory text tells us that it says the rich rules over the poor. The borrower is a servant to the lender. Oh, sometimes you know we we talk about what we do with our with our with our tithe. And Elder Rodriguez, we will pay our tithe once, mm. but but how many times we need to pay our debts? <laughs> okay. okay. Yes. So we can be a servant to um, our creditors. Yes. But this week, this month, um, is Black History Month, is it not? Yes, it is. And because it's Black History Month, and and we are not unmindful of our studies on Black History Month, and we have um, a monthly study on that. And we, we would not ignore that at all. But so let us talk a little bit of the racial wealth divide. <laughs> we have a racial wealth divide. I am so pleased that I have three financial people with me, accountants, insurance people. So they're going to teach us a lot more about the, they know a lot about the racial wealth divide. And I was looking at that, I got a quotation that says at the national level, that is in the United States, more than 20% of black households are late on paying their debts hmm. compared to 15% of white households. Next, it says that just 40% of black households reported having good or very good credit. Not excellent. They didn't, they didn't have something that says excellent. I know my, my panelists, fellow panelists will tell me there's such a category. Is that is that correct? There is. <laughs> there is such a category. Okay. So uh, again, it says this leaves the black communities with fewer good options for acquiring credit, such as payday loans. 
what what is a payday loan? I, hmm. I don't know what that is. Can somebody help me? It's a loan that you get uh, to help you tie yourself over until payday, and they're high uh, interest rates. <laughs> they're predatory. They're made okay. available so that you end up paying more for the loan than you actually got in ma- in monies. If you don't pay it on time, you can fall back so that you're in the hole every single time. Oh, my. That's, so it goes on to say uh, that death is often an overwhelming, stressful, and debilitating feeling. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. Oh, certainly. <laughs> it is correct. Okay. They say death is an overwhelming, stressful, debilitating feeling. And if there is bad credit in the Black community, then there, there would be some stress. <laughs> there would be some stress. There would It would be overwhelming and debilitating. Is that correct? Certainly. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. So on Sunday, <laughs> um, we move on to um, talk about the Bible speaks, what the Bible says about the dead problem. Exactly. So as we get into this topic, it's important for us to realize or understand what God had in mind for us. And uh, when we look at the counsel that comes to us from Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 8, it's very succinct. The word of God says for us, uh, that says, and having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. Now, I've been listening to uh, a lot of presentations that talk about debt. And it is made in such a fashion uh, that suggests that uh, debt is something that just can be avoided at all costs. Uh, (laughs) But I would say to you, that's pretty difficult to do. But there are some reasons why people go into debt. Uh, There's three listed there, as you can see. Number one, it talks about ignorance, right? You're unaware of the biblical and secular principles on finance. Uh, This church of ours, Fondren, has been very good about providing financial information of how, (coughs) excuse me, not to be in debt or for that matter, to be uh, financially empowered. Um, At the end of the, so that starts with some knowledge, but in addition to that, there'll be some uh, practice and some consistency to be, uh, to deal with. Ultimately, we are all selfish people, uh, myself <laughs> included. And that means that we have to be aware and deal with the selfish cravings that come along. We are bombarded in anything that we uh, see, whether we're driving down the street, whether we watch TV, where we're on the phones. Everybody is telling us that we can have it now. And they make it possible that we can have it now without telling us the hidden cause. And then lastly, through no fault of our own, sometimes we are dealing with the necessity of debt. We may find ourselves in a health situation where we didn't have enough to cover it. We may have a repair that was above and beyond what we thought we were able to do. So there is a source of debt that has to do with you know, these kind of elements, but Nehemiah, Nehemiah uh, talked to a lot of these issues. So let's look at some of these things and see what the word of God has to say. In Nehemiah chapter five and verse one, it says, and there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against, of all people, their Jewish brethren. For there were those who said, we, our sons and our daughters are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. Now, there was some who said, who have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we may buy grain because of the famine. Nehemiah goes on to say, there were also those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our lands and vineyard. 
Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren and our children as their children. And indeed, we are forcing our sons and daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. It is not in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. The situation was as follows. There was the haves and the have not. And in that condition, the people of God were given a different blueprint where everybody was to have. There was not supposed to be any have nots. And, and so to that end, you had conditions where there, those that have not were enslaved and they were being charged usury, which was, which was not supposed to have happened in the nation of Israel. Now, today we know that uh, <laughs> uh, the Jewish nation or the Jewish uh, group, I don't want to get into any big to do because some say they're not a nation or, or an ethnic group. But the fact is that they've had different principles that they have practiced that bring along some prosperity. But uh, that was not supposed to be an experience because the way God had arranged for his people to be that they would always have some ability to get out of debt. Back in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 8, God made blessings applicable to debt. He says, now it shall come to pass, beginning with verse 8 of Deuteronomy 28, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations on the earth and of all those blessings shall come unto you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. God intended that those who follow his counsel would be the lender and not the borrower. Now that may seem like you know a, a very absolute thing, the point I'm making here is that when you rely on God, you return to the tithe that we have talked about that made God first, and you have made God first in everything. I'm going to say it this way, and I hope you will indulge me. God is going to bless you, not because you're making a proposition, but because you made him first. The word of God is filled with promises. It says, seek ye first what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So that is why in Matthew, you hear um, uh, the word of God says, why do you worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear? God knows this stuff, right? He knows that we need these things. But just as I had made mention about Matthew 6, 33, it says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own self. Sufficient for today is its own trouble. So <clears throat> at the end of the day, what we have to come to grips with is this notion of contentment, right? And contentment means that you are okay with your current condition, even though you could use more finances, even though you may have more than what you need, but the fact is you are not trying to grind the gears of, 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 uh, of riches so that you lose sight of what you are all about. This contentment thing is what God wants us to do. Lastly, in Philippians 4, verse 10, here's what the word of God says that will be a message that I hope resonates with all of us. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Now that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be what? Content. Yeah. Well, I, I know how to be abased, which means sometimes I got to be low and I know how to abound. That sometimes I may have surplus. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm just going to say it from a personal testimony. 
If you learn that whatever your situation is, to trust in God, you will have less stress, you will have less worry, yes. and money will take care of itself. Now, I know that sounds like highfalutin talk if you seem to think I have more than you, but I'm going to tell you, I was near bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been on that other side. And I can tell you firsthand that when you make God first, he <laughs> has the obligation, the responsibility <clears throat> to, to make to, uh, make it right for you. So I trust that as we take this lesson into consideration, we will deal with this. But it begs the question, because debt is so prominent, in it. is debt a sin? Brother Jills, is debt a sin? Help me out. <laughs> Could you oh, share with us that? Testimony, Elder Rodriguez. We love that testimony. <laughs> Thank you. Well, he did tell you that we have a few court cases where in case of bankruptcy, court ordered a minimum of three, $3 million a year, $3 million a month to those persons who are in bankruptcy as their required necessary expenses. Hmm. Hmm. Just, the, just the touch, my brother. <laughs> the, the bankruptcy court uh, recognizes the, the tithe, okay? Is that just necessary, necessary to pay? Um, is that a sin? Brother Ricardo just suggested to us that there are some expenses that may come that are unplanned. And for those, he made some references such as a health bill and some other needed repairs for which we may have to go into debt. Um, so debt is not a sin. Your attitude toward debt might be the problem. Mm. Um, in fact, there is nothing wrong with um, working hard to earn money so that we can make a living. For the Bible does instruct us, you diligent man, go to the ant, well, you sluggard, as it were, you go to the ant and consider it its ways. For he, the Bible encourages us to be diligent. The challenge so many of us have uh, would include, in our diligence, we, we use our health, we sell our health to make money. Mm. And once we have made that money, we end up spending that money to re regain our health, which doesn't happen. So there is a balance. And God has promised that if you obey his instructions, he will give you the skills. He will give you the skills to live, to be successful. And that is including um, avoiding, well, being able to handle your debt with maturity uh, and responsibility. In fact, even the very fifth item there from Malachi 3, 7 to 10 will remind us that one of our challenges in our debt problem is we may not be obeying God as he has instructed us to do. Um, as, in, as in Malachi 3, 7 to 10, even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me and I will return unto you. Ultimate instruction to following God's guidance. In fact, some of the other reasons we get into debt, which might, which is likely to make it sinful, would be the greed at which we get into debt. And there is an interesting word they use called usury. Mm. Um, uh, the, Sister Chala, I'll call you back. Um, so it, the, the instructions there in Colossians 3, 5 says, put to death sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil de desires. Don't be greedy. For a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of the world. In other words, worshiping wealth. And that comes from the New Living Translation of Colossians 3, 5. Colossians 18, 10 to 13 talks about what will happen to a righteous man's son if that righteous man's son indulges in um, shady behavior. In fact, it might be worth reading that uh, Ezekiel 18, 10 to 13, again from the New Living Translation, if he, referring to a righteous man's son, fathers, sorry, referring to a righteous man, if he, a righteous man, fathers a son who is violent, a shadow of blood, who does any of these things, though he himself did none of these things, 
who even eats upon the mountains, defiles his neighbor's wife, oppresses the poor and greedy, commits robbery, does not restore the pledge, and we're going to come to the pledge of our little little, lifts up his eyes to the idols, commits abomination, lands at interest usury, um, something, somebody mentioned the word, um, the Seventh Adventist Union at uh, that time, and takes profit, shall he then leave the Bible, then continues to say, no, he will pay the price, even though he comes from a righteous uh, father. So we pay our individual prices as we go on. There is that covetousness, scamming and screaming and uh, mm. scheming, and the love of money. Again, very often we misuse this text that says uh, the love of money, uh, uh, money is the root of all evil. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that the love of money, the love of money is the root of all evil. So when we look at that, we realize that uh, in the first case, uh, uh, following godly guidance, rich, we must be rich in good works, ready to give, ready to share, do not rob other people. That in itself is a sin and you might pay the penalty. And secondly, we are told that um, you must lay up for, your tre for yourself treasures in heaven um, and you cannot serve two masters at the same time. So be mindful of, of your pursuit here, including your own character. That is the only thing Helen White says that we'll be translated with, that which we have become on this worldly, earthly journey. Uh, if you begin to love the things of this world more, um, and, and, not, and you get into debt, not for those necessary things as Brother Ricardo spoke about, but that tendency to just want more and that tendency to just want to live up to you, to the Joneses and your neighbors and your fellow church members, those mm -hmm. things are evil attitudes and they put you in debt. Those type of debts, those type of behaviors may need some spiritual guidance and some Christ-like um, adjustment. Um, but in all of it, there's nothing wrong with working hard. There's nothing wrong with having enough for the rainy day. Even the ant would have taught us those but a godly attitude is the right thing to do. Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the most high. When you would have made last week, we found that David made that decision. I will give to the Lord. I have vowed as, as to how I'll support the cause of the church of the, uh, uh, well, in this case, the church, how I'll support the cause of our wider society, feed the widows, um, the orphans, and be honest in our deeds. And finally, I would like to read uh, 1 you? Timothy 6, 17 to 19. Question, Command brother. those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us righteously all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. I have a question. I have a question that is a little lore coming down to us. Um, have you ever made idols out of money, wealth, or possessions? Has anybody no. ever had that challenge? No. Where where you where you spend your time, <clears throat> you spend your energy um, getting uh, money um, and on your possession, on your wealth. Um, someone visited with me this week and she said her husband, her divorced husband, who used to be a, bass, a baseball player, um, has some money, but it's how he treated people so badly with such contempt. I think at that point in time, uh, money, access to money and your attitude change is, is not worth it. You know, you know, six days a week, we spend the time doing what? Worshiping. Six days a week is working. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're working. Yeah. And I, I understand uh, um, of the jokes that there, there is there is worshiping, but um, you know, some people 
spend every waking hour looking at the market, looking at how much more they can bring in, and do not have time for the 6 a.m. prayer, the 9 a.m. prayer, the 12 a.m. prayer, and they are trying to, as you were saying, looking at their material possessions, look what I have. Um, isn't that idolatry, my brother? Yes, certainly we, we um, all those attitudes are um, given more, 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 pre more worshiped, worshiping wealth than um, celebrating God's provision. Um, multi, um, I, I honestly think um, if your attitude is right, there should be uh, your, your, your income, your, your access to funds, your access to money should not be limited. But if when that when that becomes um, idolatrous, that you pay attention to that well, then um, some spiritual corrections would be needed. So I have a question to the panel. The I gave you a text that says, "Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things." Is well part of these things that we're talking about? Because. It, if it is, it strikes me that people look at time with God as a waste or counteraction to wealth. And wealth uh, in and of itself is the problem. If you have contentment, the Bible is filled with all kinds of uh, people that had wealth. Abraham, much wealth. Joseph was wealthy. That's right. All these folks. So it is not yeah. It is the it's this pursuit of wealth that is the issue. But if you seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, you can't help but be blessed, right? Amen. You can't help but I've seen people who roll up in the church with nothing. They are faithful and God blesses. And all of a sudden, people look at them side eye as if, you know, you are so wealthy and this, that, and the other. Hey. My my priority is straight. I'm seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And at the end of the day, money is just a resource that God has given your hand. Maybe you dress a little bit better. Maybe you're able to drive or something a little bit better. But at the end of the day, that does not define me, nor should it be my motivation in terms of this relationship with God. And I had a thought on that. You said that God has given into your hand. I also believe that uh, I have a 90% belief on that. that but I believe that at least 90% of that, God might be passing through you to others. I, I, might I, be a, just a simple conduit yes, of God's yes, grace. I agree with you. Agree with you. So, so Dr. Karen, then how do we get out of debt? <laughs> <laughs> how do we get out of debt? Yes, please. Let, let me start with um, the widow's cry. The widow's cry. And this is some, a story Brother Dawes, that we know well, and it comes with Elisha and the widow. And it reads in 2 Kings uh, 4, it says, A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophet cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. Mm. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. Mm. And guess who comes? The creditors came oh, yeah. to take my two sons to be the, his slave. So Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? And the man of God is there, right? Yes. Tell me, you know, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Yes. And he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere. Isn't this God's doing? Yes, yes. From yes. all your neighbors, empty vessels do not gather just a few. And I'll skip to verse 6. It, now it came to pass when the vessels were full, and she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not enough room to receive it, Hmm. Or, or is it not another vessel? <laughs> <laughs> so the oil ceased. Yes. Then she came and told the man of God, 
And he said, go sell the oil and pay your debt and you and your son shall live on the rest. Brother Dawes, get up in the morning. Go out in that truck. And sell the oil. Sell the oil. <laughs> it is the Lord that brought that to you. What a wonderful, what a wonderful story. But we have an application that has been recommended. It says if you, if you want to get out of that step one is to declare a moratorium on additional debt. Step number one. When you declare that moratorium on the, the, the debt, no more credit spending, if you do not borrow the money, you can't get into debt if you do not. If you don't borrow any more money, you can't get further into debt. Amen. Step number two. When God blesses you with extra money, don't spend it. Use it to pay your debt. And the third step is to arrange your debts from the largest to the smallest. From the largest to the smallest. And then um, ne next, double up or increase your payments in any way you can on the debt of the bottom of the list. As you eliminate your smaller high interest debts, you will free up, you will free up a surprising amount of money to place on your next higher debt. Amen. So practical. And I have a four, I have a fourth, I have a fourth yes, uh, point to make on that. <clears throat> Budget your money in such a way that you can stay out of debt. It is not the amount of money that you make that counts. It's how you spend your money and how much you can save. It is not the amount of money that you get will lead you to successful uh, to successfully free yourself from debt. It is how you spend your money. That cannot be overemphasized. If you budget your money, and you know you're on a salary, you're in a fixed income as it were when you're on a salary, you're in a fixed income. And you know that at the end of the year, your salary is going to be $174,000 a year. You should be able to budget your expenses in such a way that you can pay, pay tithes and offering, have a, a nest egg, do all the other things you want to do, and still have money left over. But it's, we get into trouble when we live above our means, our income. The other thing is, number five, is our investments. We should be able to make some investments that are uh, steady enough to bring us some extra money. While we are sleeping, those investments are growing. Now, you had asked a question earlier, Brother Carrington, about is it idolatry to be watching the money and the market and this, that, and the other? I did not invest in the stock market. I, ha I have not invested in the stock market. Or when I did, I had to be listening to the Asian markets, what's going on in Asia. I can't sleep. I cut all of that out. So I don't have to worry about nothing. I can sleep all night until next morning. Be healthy about my sleep. Don't have to worry whether the market goes up or down. That is not my forte. I don't invest in those things. Some people can do it. I couldn't do it because I don't. I want to sleep when night comes. And so... Uh, the question you ask is if watching your investment 
is um, sinful. Uh, I don't know about that, but one thing I do know, it causes a lot of stress when you have to be watching the market hour by hour or day by day, and day and night. So what when I first got into the investment business, my advisor told me, invest your money where you can get up in the morning, you can see it, you can touch it, you can feel it. You don't have to worry about it <laughs> disappearing when the man leaves your office and you give him that check. So that's what I have been doing. And so far, I am content with that. But I do believe that you have to work and invest and uh, give yourselves an extra opportunity to make some money. And the, the last thing is not to get into consumer debt. Don't get into consumer debt because when you buy those things, they depreciate so fast and you can't resell them and you are stuck with the debt. So those are the, the, the five or six points, three other points I wanted to add on there, how to get out of debt. How about the get rich quick schemes, uh, Elder Brother? Dog? <laughs> yeah, that's very important. People, First, I want to deal with the aspect of surety. The aspect of surety. As Solomon warns that you should not become a surety for another person. Why? He says, do not be one who shakes hand in pledge or puts up surety for debts. You see, when you go to the banker, and ask for a loan or whoever it is. And they ask you that you need to go and get a co-signer. Mm. It means your credit on your own is not good enough. And that co-signer is basically making that loan and giving it to you. Now, in these modern days, before you had uh, FICA and and um, the computer that is going to record, it was bad enough. But now you have the debt in your name. The other person has that money in his pocket. And he's not concerned about it. That debt belongs to the surety. And so Solomon, way back then in Proverbs 22, 26, remind us, that we should not be surety for another. What does that mean? Don't co-sign for anybody. They might not like it, but you have to find a nice way of saying, brother, I love you. You're a good friend of mine. I've known you for years. We have been together in this thing. We have been all this together, but I cannot <laughs> give you my name I cannot lend my name to your project no sir yes sir Dawes, I have a, yes a couple, sir just a couple questions to ask you you have yes sir. A, person, a foreign student who now is waiting on money to come from overseas and the person is yes, in sir. a college or university and that money hasn't come, they need to pay the rent, they need somebody else named mm -hmm. on the rent, and um, mm -hmm. they want somebody to sign for the student loan. I, I, I say I wouldn't sign on the student loan. I, I would just I'll just pay the money. But how about so so you're nice enough to pay the money? How about the, the rent? that they want somebody with some financial thing on the rent. Um, would you sign on that? Well, I'm going back to Solomon again. You know what Solomon <laughs> says? 
<laughs> I'm sorry, that's what Solomon says, sir. Well, Solomon I'm, says, do not sign for the man. My brother, I, no, I, I have I'm not saying you mustn't try and help him in any way possible. Huh? Brother Jokes, you're on mute. Brother Jokes, I'm not hearing you. You're on mute, Brother Joe. A question um, in line with the opening statement of um, African-American debt, uh, would, would some of what we have been in or came through, would that, would Solomon, should Solomon be put aside a little so that we can carry each other over this period of um, ownership and restoration and correcting what we were robbed of or uh, <laughs> that we didn't have access to? I... I'm so glad you asked that question because what we need to do is to form a cooperative okay. or an investment club okay. and help one another and look and help one another and stop being so divisive and so singular in our operation. We need to develop some trust. And so I hope that whoever is hearing me tonight <laughs> will go out and form some alliances with people who you can trust, with people who are like-minded and form an investment club, a little investment club that can move us forward, all of us the so -so. forward. Um, yes, sir. <laughs> when, when you have enough money to give away, then you can become a surety on that item. But if you're struggling like each of us, then each of us need to lift each other up in the whole project by us, with ourselves and learn from one another the best ways of investing, working, and bringing in income. But we should not make it a habit to borrow or lend. Oh, get rich quick scheme. Let me continue <laughs> on that. <laughs> and then it talks about, it says a man devoid of understanding, shakes hands in a pledge. Now, the next one is, and, and Proverbs 22, verse 26 says, um, that is the same idea about surety for a debt, but let's go to get rich quick. It says in second in 1 Timothy 6, 9 to 11, Wait. but oh, those who desire to be rich, fall into temptation and a sneer and into foolish and harmful lust, which draw, drown men in destruction and perdition. For, sorry, for the love, of uh, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith mm. in their what? Greediness and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Now, the statistics are out, and it shows that the people in the poorest communities across this nation not only in this state, but in this nation, exist in minority communities that can least afford it. And yet in the minority com communities, we buy the more lotto tickets than anybody else. And that is a part of the problem. Mm -hmm. These are statistics. These are not uh, disputed, I mean, items that can be disputed. The information is out there where the, the, the communities that can least afford to buy the lotto tickets are the ones that 
the most uh, spend the most money on lotto. And desire. And then when you if you buy a lot of Yes, and if you buy a lot of ticket and you are in that neighborhood, <laughs> everybody knows you get the you won the lotto. Mm -hmm. And so when they come to the store or you meet them on the street, they go buy stuff right in your face and say, Oh, he can pay for it. Let him pay for it. He has the money. He just won the ticket, man. Let him pay for it. And so the problem becomes where not only you you are in danger for your life because if you don't <laughs> buy this stuff for the poor people in the neighborhood, your friends, they'll kill you. And if you win the money and they know you win the money, they'll get after you. And not only that, you spend so much money trying to win uh, the lotto or get rich quick in whatever scheme, because it's not just the lotto that is a get rich quick scheme. All kinds of Ponzi scheme goes on. And honest people get hooked or drawn into these things because the people who come to you with these things seem so honest and sincere. And God is warning us that we should flee those things Flee, and what we should do, we should pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. So the problem is God is advising us to stay away, stay away from those things. Yes, sir. Elder uh, Rodriguez, um, uh, in conclusion, are there any loans that people should take? Yes. So uh, this whole uh, study is about avoiding debt. Now, it's impossible in this day and age to not have some debt. And um, yes. you were going to be living on a cash basis. Some would never be able to advance or wait till they're almost uh, <laughs> near the grave before. But there are some 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 yes. amount of debt. And, and uh, you'll be surprised that God acknowledged that. Uh, here in Deuteronomy chapter 15, it says, at the end of every seven years, you must what? Cancel debt. So that means that there was circumstances where debt was taking place. Now, notice how this thing uh, plays out in the word of God. Uh, Deuteronomy 15 verse five talks about canceling. And it says that every creditor who has lent anything shall release the person. So the most that they could have them in debt is seven years. It's interesting how the seven year loan, it's kind of like the outlier, the, the, the maximum that you see in many of these uh, car loans now that used to be five years, now they're going as far as seven because I guess statistics will prove out that you go longer than that, you're in, you're in trouble of actually ever collecting that debt. But what are some reasons that one might have debt, right? So mortgage. If you're going to buy a home, and I'm talking about not some mortgage outside of your ability to, man to, to, to uh, manage it, is a reason for debt, right? Most mortgages are 20, 30-year mortgages. <clears throat> but... Even though you may get a 30 or 20 year mortgage, you should try to accelerate the payments so that you get out of debt. Because remember what we said earlier, uh, the lender is uh, the one who controls the life of the borrower. <laughs> and so even though it may be a good reason to do it, you still don't want to be in that condition. Okay, other reasons for a loan, education. Back in the day of the children of Israel, uh, a father or a parent might give to their child land so that they might be able to produce their own income and wealth. In our uh, industrial society, education is really, uh, even today, the most uh, reasonable way to acquire <laughs> wealth and have um, the ability to take care of oneself. But um, 
these educational loans or these home loans, they all may be necessity, but in all cases, it should be with the idea to retire it sooner than later. So um, we, I don't want to leave us with the uh, the impression that somehow if you are having a loan that you have sinned against God. That's not the case. <laughs> what God is wanting you to do is to make him a partner with you. First, as Elder Dawes okay. is saying, put first things first. Allow God to bless you. And he's given you... Uh, yes. uh, uh, he's giving you a job. He's giving you income so that you might be able to trust him. And as you trust him, yes. his hand is open to bless. Now, it seems counterintuitive because you're like they like the old slick salesman was says, you got to spend money to make money. <laughs> but in this case, you're returning to God what is already his. And that allows God to trust you with more. And because you have that relationship, you're able to do. My brother, I, yes. I have one last question. I, I don't have, uh, you have indulged me this evening. Go right ahead. I am looking at the Oakwood University tuition package per semester. It says $14,682 if you live on campus. Right. Uh, help me with you think did... that the financial aid office has a <laughs> lot of people who is going and asking for a student loan? Well, let's begin that before you get to the loan part, perhaps you ought to be of such a mind and planning for scholarships and grants. They're out there, right? You'd be surprised how much money is passed over because people don't even go out and look through the grants and scholarship that may be available to them. That's number one. Number two, if you want to go Amen. to college, you ought to start saving some money of your own, right? I remember, and this may be a yes. little bit off topic, the best gift I ever got was a used bike because that, it, it, then when I fixed it up, it meant more to me than if it was new. And I just, I had put skin in the game, yes. if you will, to the thing that I, I value. The same thing goes with an education. It's a, it's a tool that you're going to use the rest of your life, so you need that as well. And then finally... There may be a need for loans, right? And those loans are not intended to be lifelong loans. Now, we know there's predatory lending to students, and you can get you a credit card when you arrive on campus. But the fact is, this uh, view of education has to, be, uh, has to be considered in the light of a tool, not just an educate, you know, get a, a degree in something that there is no job market to. That's not a wise investment of time. But one last piece of evidence it says that at the time of registration, 70% needs to be paid in the amount yes. of 10,000. Yes. Yes. And that was in 2020. I, I, I'm sure it must have gone up by now. Right. I think there's going to be a whole lot of student loans going on. That's exactly so. But again, a student loan to me is not a bad thing per se. It's a bad thing when you don't have a plan to retire it. Otherwise, it becomes like the ancient mariner, this dead albatross <laughs> around your neck for the rest of your life. That is not what that is intended to be. And unfortunately for a lot of young people, I, I they don't think about debt in that fashion. Elder Dawes. Can I say Yes. We, when, when I was young, I really never had the idea that uh, my education was an investment. They just tell me to go to school. Right. And, but now I realize that getting an education is an investment. And can I add one thing here? When I got my degree, and I left school. The last thing I did when I left the college was to stop at the bank and collect my CD, which became the down payment on my first house in New York City. Mm -hmm. In other words, we should plan ahead. I didn't leave college with a loan. I left college with a, a check to go and invest. And and in 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 real estate in New York City, so it's possible 
for us to look at our education as an investment and don't take courses that are uh, non-usable. You can use nothing. You just go to college. You're on campus for four years, just being a nice guy on campus and everything. Yeah. And after graduation, you don't even know what you're graduating. And no, we have to be serious about before you get that loan or even go to college, be serious about what the outcome is going to be like. And I agree with you, brother uh, Rodriguez. Uh, look at the end. How much money am I going to earn? And then when you get out and get a job or working in a profession, your concentration would be to retire that debt as best as possible. Amen. My, what, one, one last thing about that, you know, as a person who has been responsible for charging the school, mm. uh, and every, every year it was going to go up, um, the students are going to have loans. The students do not yeah. know what's going to happen as to when they get out. It is the administrator who knows that. And so, and so what, I, what I'm suggesting is that, uh, and Rodriguez, I think you put it right, uh, you did put it right, that there are some things that are unavoidable, but the, um, the mm -hmm. medicine comes after. Right. I've been struggling as if I should make a statement, but I think I'll be, it wouldn't be fair for me not to make a statement. Of course, I believe in Christian education. I, I myself, as a graduate of um, Christian education, um, we must know to those numbers that you deliberately called that there are many institutions, high-end institutions, um, with base need funding that you can graduate from one of those schools, including even Baylor right out here, um, debt free, all funded by scholarships and other awards. So, I mean, I don't know if I, I mean, I hope this is taken for what it's worth. Yeah. Well, let's. Because parents need to direct our children. As parents, we need to direct our children. Yes, but. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. That is correct. All right, let's take a look at our takeaway. Uh, Dr. Carrington, can you share? Yes. Make a solemn covenant with God that by his blessing. Yes. You will pay your debts and then owe no man anything if you live on <laughs> courage. I've, I've done that. Yeah, and and bread. Bread. Yes, sir. It is so easy in preparing your table to throw out your pocket 25 cents for extras. Take care the pennies and the dollars will take care of yes, sir themselves. It is the mites here yes, sir. and the mites there that are spent for this, that, and the other that soon run up into dollars. Deny self at yes, least sir. while you are walled up, while you are walled in with them. Deny self at least while you are walled up in that. Amen. Amen. Mm. Can yes, you do us a prayer? Yes, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are encouraged. We are encouraged to lean on you, to follow your directives, to follow the Bible, and to get out of debt. We know in this society, the society is set up in such a way that sometimes it's unavoidable. But help us not to allow ourselves to fall into sin. And from that sin, it leads us to get into debt, debt with that we cannot come out of. We ask that you forgive us of the sin of covetousness because from that sin comes a lot of other 
branches of uh, misrepresentation of your word. Help us to fall on your word, to follow your word, and to acknowledge that you are the sovereign God of everything we have and everything that we will ever be. Forgive us of our sins, we pray, and bless us and keep us until we come back next Sabbath again to discuss your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for joining us. I hope that uh, you received good counsel on managing debt. This time, we'd like to share with you our mission spotlight. Yes. More than 100 years ago, a literature evangelist, Philip Rieke, got on his bike and rode to the middle of nowhere in Australia to share the love of Jesus with people he encountered. He sold books that impacted thousands of lives around the world. In 2022, a small group of Adventists representing multiple countries met together in the United States and rode their bikes from Washington, D.C. to St. Louis, where the GC session was held, in tribute to Philip Rieke and his ministry. They shared Adventist literature along the way. Well, we're riding from Washington, D.C. to St. Louis, and we've just finished eight days of riding, just three to go. We are in Madison right now in Indiana, and every day we just get up and we ride into the sunset. So we are heading west. Each day we're riding about 100 to 120 miles, uh, which for those of you working in kilometers is around 160 to 190 kilometers. Uh, yesterday, it was hot. It got up to 40 degrees Celsius. That's where I'm from. I, I think that's about 100. The first three days were terrible for me. It's was rain and cold. I wear five clothes, and uh, even five clothes, I'm still shivering. But the, the weather got warmer, I, I feel better. And I, I can feel I get stronger now. For me, the most inspiring thing has been the fact that People are interested in taking the books. The opportunity to share the gospel, to share the truths of God's word, to share valuable literature with people so that they might experience eternal life themselves. That's just what it's all about. I think in the early days, um, we knew that there was going to be adventure. We knew that there was going to be opportunities to share. Uh, of course, there's the cycling. And I think the whole experience for me has brought together uh, my faith, sharing it, um, and something I love. In this trip, I can do cycling and I can sharing the ministry, selling the literature for the people in America. And this is a wonderful experience for me. The thing that will stick with me is uh, just step out in faith and see what God does. Uh, for me, I'm going to say I will go much, much more often. On Sunday, June 5, 2022, the eight riders arrived in St. Louis. They completed 1,147 miles of cycling through the mountains, heat, and rain. They honored Philip Rieke's legacy by passing out more than 4,000 pieces of literature. 